I think we can all agree that there was nothing trivial about any of that. Uh, it is a, a, a marvelous way, Amanda's talk, uh, to introduce uh, what remains of this panel. Um, today is, in fact, a very special day, and I, I know that, that Teo and I feel very privileged um, that this conference could also serve as a moment uh, to serve as a book launch for a very special book. Now, I hold in my hand a copy of the newly printed and translated book, The House of Alice Rotten, Cambridge Doctor, Humanist Patron and Activist, uh, which was written by our next speaker, Javier Munoz Buigros. Now, um, in what follows, we will hear first from um, Javier, the author of this excellent and very interesting and exciting tale of this house's journey through the ages as a house of refuge from the 1930s to this very day. Uh, uh, the, the only citation that somehow can make sense uh, of the wonders of this house is right from the book of Isaiah, uh, where the prophet says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Uh, and the, the talk that we will hear uh, is, will, will be about this book, which shows just how this house served in this way uh, through the entire, through much of the 20th century. Um, we will also hear, and are very happy to hear, from Jeffrey Rotten, Alice's son, who will um, also is a, is a testament to the way in which this house, Nine Adams Road, continues to this very day to serve as a house of prayer for all people, as a house of refuge for those who are doing good work on behalf of humanity in every possible uh, avenue, discipline, um, and form of work. So without further ado, yes, um, we will also, sorry, yes, Jeffrey will also, uh, and I should have added, present a book uh, to Trinity College um, uh, during, uh, during, during the midst of his talk, uh, which we're very very, very grateful for. Um, for copies of the book, and I, I don't want to impose such banalities on Javier, but if you want copies of the book, you should want copies of the book. Uh, it is available hot off the press, first from Heifers, just next door. Um, there are also ways of getting slightly discounted copies of the book uh, if you write to me, and I can connect you uh, through the right avenues to the right people. Right. Without further ado, let me welcome uh, to the podium Javier Munoz Quigros, the author of this very excellent book, who will speak to us um, about it and about the House of Alice. Good afternoon. <coughs> um, Aaron and, and Theo, thank you very much uh, for your invitation. Uh, but my presence uh, in this conference is to introduce my book, The House of Alice Rowton, Cambridge Doctor, Humanist, Patron and Activist from the Edgodian to Contemporary. This is the book I brought in book in Catalan. They, they translate in Spanish and now in English. Now I am very happy. I am sorry for, for my English. This book is a personal vision into, into, into the life of the doctor and humanist Alice Rowton 1905-1995, who lived the change of the 20th century from her house in Nine Adams Road, Cambridge. For, from her home, she had taken an altruist lifestyle. Dr. Altis Rauton took in the refugees and different moments of, of her life. Alice practiced psychiatry and general medicine with other activities. She had dynamic in the movement of medics against nuclear warfare and against specula urban speculation. Alice Rauton was, in addition, patron of artists and intellectuals as they were, like the Catalan musician Robert Gerard or the German dancer Kurt George and many, many others. My first stay in a Dr. Rauton, Rauton's home in Cambridge in 1978 made me a big impression on me. After that, I came with my family to spend most of my summer holidays at Nine Adams Road in the 80s. I enjoyed these family, family, uh, this, this family holidays in the idyllic sitting of Cambridge in the summer and in the unique special atmosphere at Nine Adams Road. Also, I was fascinated by the serene calm of the college the greens and the streets of Cambridge, their pleasant bike ride early in the morning or returning to the house in the evening along the silent barrels walk with a great deal of the well-ordered nature. 
At the end of 2011, I decided to investigate Alice's work. Jeffrey Roughton, son of Alice, helped me. But what must have surprised him most was that a Catalan with a limited oral and listening English abilities should be so interpreted to, as a, to write an in-deep biography of a relevant if English woman like Alice. But the, but the Rauton family is generous, and Jeffrey <coughs> trusted me. He invited me so, uh, to spend a few days in his home, and there I began to investigate into the back room of the fascinating history of the his remarkable mother. Alice, <coughs> I have to, to drink water, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Alice came from the well-to-do bourgeois family. She was a granddaughter of John Hopkinson, who researched in the field of electricity in the Second Industrial Revolution. And she was daughter of the Better Hopkinson, Better Hopkinson Professor of Mechanism at Cambridge University, who was killed in the First World, uh, first world War. Her paternal grandmother, Evelyn Evelyn, influenced her in the philanthropic activities. Alice cultivated sacred pride in her brave ancestors, but she was different from them and transformed her splendid family home on Nine Adam Road into a meeting place for a all kin of people. Alice was connected with the social movements which appeared in Cambridge in the 30s. The eminent economist John Robinson, Alice close friend, influenced her socialist ideas. After completing her medical studies, she, she took her first step, steps in the philanthropic activity. Thanks to her efforts, by 1936, she had managed to the construction of the building residence in London called Bison House the profits from which are used for a social purposes. After the eruption of the Second World War, Alice took in her home, took in her home refugees who had escaped from the war zones and from London that was under menace of bombing attacks. There was also a refugee group from Germany. At the same time, her husband, Jack Roughton, professor of colloid science in Cambridge University, was offered a research position, position, position at Harvard University. And he and his two children packed their bags and they moved to the United States. Alice remained in Nine Dunham Road with the refugees, of course. Around 1942, Alice announced that, to the, her guests that the members of the company Ballet Joes would be taking up residence at Nine Adam Road. Kurt Joes have been clear exponent of the leaf wing culture of the Mima Republic. Joes used the Oak Room, the, the living main room of, of Nine Adam Road, for training and to give ballet lessons to the young people of Cambridge. The dancing and music made a joyful atmosphere, atmosphere in the house, a little of optimism at a time when happiness was not exactly the order of the day. A few, a few, a few days before Joe's arrival, Alice had received a phone call, phone call from John Main, Maynard Keynes, who asked if she could take in, in some members of the Valley, com of Valley Company. Kins has been uh, had been married to the Russian ballerina Lydia Lopukova and, and, and this had closely connected with him with the wall of the dance. Alice didn't like what Kins represented. He was famous, a man from Kins College, part of the Cambridge intellectual elite. She detested money. Kin's job, and didn't like his superior heirs, but she helped them. 
At the same time, Cecilia, Alice's youngest sister, recalled with particular nostalgia the evening in Ina Adam Road during the, the war, referring to the days when Alice returned home after a long day attending to her patients and then began another, another ditty, like cooking dinner for a guest. At one point during the war, Alice started her open Sunday, Sunday evenings when she invited anyone who wished to come to dinner. People only met and talked informally in the room. The tradition, which lasted 40 years, was conceived as a way to forget about the drama of the war for a while and to enjoy some relaxing moments of good cheer in such sad, in, in such sad times. Just in outside of Cambridge, there was a German POW camp. These prisoners were sometimes given permission to help Alice in the garden or with the cows. Herbert Oblands, to the enemy, was because she was a humanist who saw the soldiers not as an enemy, but as a, a human beings in need of help. Alice was away a busy new worker. Today we, we, we heard something about that. She introduced Kurt Hose, very close friend of Alice, to Robert Gerard, very close friend of Alice too, hoping that they, may, they, they might work together. The result was the Belle Pandora, with the dedicate, dedicate to Alice, was performed in the Cambridge Arts Theatre in the 24th January 1944. In the end of the war, Jack and the children returned to Cambridge and discovered that the house was no longer the same. Alice decided not to take neither and road to, the, to, to its previous family home status. The only bright testimony of the, this, um, her decision was a notice which she painted on the front of the door, saying, please walk in. The house was conceived as an open place. It will, it will be hers and her families, but essentially it will also belong to her friends, her patients, any refugees who turn it up, any and young study, uh, students. She ha the house became a dynamic space where all sorts of public and private events, civic campaigns and spontaneous artistic performances took place in a room. Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce gave memorable concerts there, plus many other functions, such as the Chinese New Year, Alice organized every year, or only or the arrival at Nine Adam Drop of 50 refugees in 1956 from Budapest after Soviet invasion. In the end of the 50s, broad property speculation to Cambridge, and as a result of the new, man a new urban planning, a project approved by the city council. The, the, the council wanted to re replace the old build buildings in that heart of the city with more modern constructions. For example, a shopping center called Lion Yard. Alice became involved as a citizen activ activist and founded the Campaign Civic Society against the Lion Yard project. Alice camp Alice's campaigns did not work, unfortunately. And as you can see for yourself, if you walk today through the area of the Lion Yard and the Grand Arcade, you can check that this she lost in this campaign because she against that project. Alice was member also of the campaign of from nuclear disarmament, Cine D, D, and she was very active in the 60s. One of the support groups from the, the CDND in, in Cambridge was the co called Newman Against the Bomb. Its members were well-intentioned activists and naturally they met in 
in the Oak Room of Vinad and Road. Among the, the periodic meetings were Stephen Hawking and his first wife, Jane. As a doctor, she was a very active in the Pacifist Medical Association for the Prevention of War and Nuclear Weapons. The conservative member of their profession attacked them for working on political subjects. The pacifist doctors responded that war is a, is a sign of a mental disorder, which result included damages and illnesses, and that doctors should be concerned to prevent it. During my stay in Aydan Road, I met the Chileans exile, Amanda talked about that, who lived in the house. Perhaps they were the last refugees in Nine Adam Road. The most remarkable was a friend of Alice's, Albert Bunster, who had been Chile's, Chile's ambassador to London from Allende's government. Finally, I would like to conclude that Alice's determination was not in vain, in my opinion. Her ethical position against injustice and many other people who have committed themselves to building a better world has been the base of the great change the great change humanity has made. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you might to, uh, be interested in this history of a generous and altruist woman was, who was Dr. Alice Rauton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Javier, for this talk. Porque es no libre, están todos en su dette. Nous sommes vraiment dans votre dette, monsieur. Grand merci. Merci. Uh, we are now uh, in, in, very pleased to be able to hear a very short reading from Jeffrey Rotten, Alice's son. Uh, followed by the presentation of a copy of this book uh, to Trinity College and to Nicholas Bell, the fellow librarian of the college, um, after which uh, I will ask the three panelists, Amanda, Javier, and Jeffrey, to take a seat uh, for some questions uh, before we march our merry way over to the master's lodge. Now, uh, Jeffrey, did you have a page from the book that you, yes, you hope yes, to read yes, for yes. us? The first thing I want to say, though, is... Show me an ocean not full of drops. Because that was a challenge that she would offer to anyone who thought her effort to do something wouldn't lead anywhere. There was no point. There's too big a problem. Well, <coughs> she had a certain spirit about her. In fact, sometimes too much of a spirit. Um, you know, I speak as her son, but I thought you might be interested. Where did these qualities come from? Well, the, f the first Alice Hopkinson, because that was her maiden name, was the daughter of a stonemason who um, <clears throat> lived and worked in the early... <coughs> It were in the eighteen seventy in seventeen eighties to eighteen twenties. One day, he was a stonemason. He made mills. One day, a Yorkshire businessman, John Lomax, um, lost his way, and he saw them working, and uh, <coughs> he was riding over from Yorkshire to Lancashire um, to view a possible business opportunity. Um, well, he, as I say, he lost his way, but stop, he started to inquire of the um, stonemason how to get to where he wanted to go. And then uh, a young girl came out and gave the stonemason his lunch, wrapped up in a red handkerchief. Um, 
Alice was her name. He, <coughs> well, he got into the habit of whenever he went from Yorkshire to Lancashire to see, go and see the Eastern Racer and the young pretty daughter. And eventually he put a suggestion to, to Alice. I can't marry you, my lass, he said, because I've already got a wedded wife in Yorkshire. But I've bought a mill in Manchester and a good house where I'll be pleased to put you up and I'll come to you, like, treat you like a good husband all your days. <laughs> so, you know, that was the deal. <laughs> um, this was in about 1824. Alice thought about it for a while, and then she said, OK. And Lomax was absolutely as good as his word. Um, he was a wealthy mill owner. Um, <coughs> And Alice bore him three children. Um, then one day, he arrived in great excitement. And he said, My darling Alice, I've got wonderful news for you. My first wife's died. So you and I can now be wed properly. Certainly not, she said. <laughs> I, <have, coughs> I plan to have more children. And I'm not having half of them bastards and the other half rightly born. So I will stay with you, but I won't marry you. Now, to say that in 1824 is very different from saying that now. In fact, um, I have a son out for so I know all about that. And so that in comfortable, wealthy Manchester, because Manchester's role in terms of wealth is rather like the city of London today, um, she imposed her children on the local people and um, under pressure from her and with Lomax's support, they made good. Her eldest son, John Hopkinson, became mayor of Manchester. And he, uh, remember, he was born, he was a bastard, and here he was, mayor of Manchester. And <coughs> his so another son of his, that's Mayor of Manchester's son, seemed to be very good at uh, maths. And he was sent to Owen College. But they said, you sent anyone to Cambridge, see how he gets on there. So he came up to this college where he was senior wrangler and Smith's Prizeman. Now, Senior Wrangler um, and Smith's Prizeman in 1871 meant that you were the top, one of the top mathematicians in the world. I asked Michael Atier recently whether he'd been Senior Wrangler and he just smiled because the custom of naming the Senior Wrangler stopped in 1908. But most people knew who it was. 
Bertrand Russell never got to be senior wrangler, by the way, but that's by the way. But because he was senior wrangler, the college offered him an immediate fellowship. But that required him to sign his agreement to the 39 canons of the Church of England. He refused. Somehow or other, that requirement was dropped. And what you had happen, of course, I mean, we would have the Origin of Species published a few years before, but what was happening in Cambridge was uh, casting off the shackles, the censorship, if you like, of the church. And what then has happened in Cambridge is amazing. 29 Nobel Prize winners, a huge number of this college, there's been a dispute as to whether this college had more Nobel Prize winners than France. Uh, many of us who were, were Trinity men, which I was, um, not with any distinction, um, until it was corrected by uh, uh, Martin Rees. Um, but I think that the fact that that change took place is an example of an individual making a major sociological change. Um, now, since that time, Practically every generation in my family has been someone called Alice. My older daughter has Alice as a middle name. She became a doctor, an army doctor, and has just retired with the rank of lieutenant colonel. She's a tough cookie. Um, and she was lucky to find a young man who could cope with that? <laughs> anyway, um, I hope that tradition will continue. And one part of it is the house at Nine Adams Road. Now that has come to me, and I've got between three and five years left failing a bicycle accident. Um, and I'm hoping to find a way of keeping it going. The door is still not locked. Uh, there's a community of about 10 people who live there. And because I'm incredibly lazy, they have to operate on a system called benevolent anarchy. Um, and it works very, very well. So there are no forms, there are no agreements, no leases. No, you know, it's, it's a marvellous place. Call by if you're in that part of Cambridge. Thank you very much.